Last time we took a glance at the stealth genre, and more specifically the stealth system of Metal Gear Solid 5 in an attempt to break down the mechanics that we want to create. Today we'll be using that knowledge to start building a stealth system of our very own. Over the next few videos we'll be exploring the enemy component of our stealth system, firstly by getting them set up with some simple behaviours, then knuckling down and giving them some real AI. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. So, we should all recognise this little guy from last time when we made the parkour system. I came to the conclusion then that things were getting a little lonely for him in that big old map that I made for him. After that map got corrupted thanks Unity, I spent hours of painstaking work trying to give our boy here someone to share his brand new void with. This will be our enemy for the time being, and before we can even begin programming, we need to set a few things up. We can't just tell our enemy to go from one point to another and expect them to do it. This is programming after all, and expecting computers to behave is not a luxury that we have. If something stands in between our enemy and his destination, then we need a way of telling the enemy that they have to pick a different way around, rather than just going straight ahead. Luckily for me, Unity has a pretty robust built-in navigation system that will find a path for me. Firstly, we'll set up a small environment with a few simple obstacles and set these obstacles along with the floor to be navigation static, meaning they will be included in the baking process. From here, we take our environment and bake it all into something called a nav mesh. A nav mesh is basically just a blanket that goes over our little map and defines where an enemy or a nav mesh agent can go. This blue area here is the only area that agents will be allowed to move on. The things that were made navigation static have told the system that they are to be included under this blanket. Now that we have a nav mesh, we can put our enemy on it, give him an agent component, a destination, a camera and a good slap on the bum and away he goes, avoiding all the obstacles in his way. I'm getting ahead of myself though, so let's take a step back. The navigation system in Unity is great for what it is, but for all the heavy lifting it does in the pathfinding department, it's not exactly a plug and play kind of system. You might notice these little curved lines coming off of the obstacles. These are called off mesh links and they are used as a way of bridging separate pieces of the nav mesh together. If you want your enemy to jump over gaps, then off mesh links will create that movement. In the case of my obstacles here, these off mesh links allow the enemy to get up and down to that little bit of nav mesh on top. But wait, no they don't. My guess here is that Unity Technologies just straight up didn't finish their nav mesh framework or purposefully left stuff out just to fuck with me. These links actually do let enemies drop down from platforms, but for some bizarre reason, they can't go back up the same links. The funny thing is, these things have the functionality to go in both directions, so why can't they do that here? I can't generate these links myself, it's all done by the engine, so I have to resort to manually placing my own links to allow enemies the basic functionality that Unity half-heartedly tried to provide. It's frustrating to be sure, but it's not a roadblock either. We'll come back to these links later on and see what we can do with them. For now though, we have some programming to do, so let's set up some enemy patrols. If you were making a system like this yourself and you wandered over to the Unity documentation to help you get started, you may come across this nifty little algorithm right here. If we make an array of points that go around our little map, slap this code onto our enemy and give him the array, he will go around this array of points in a neat little circle. This code takes that array and loops through it point by point, giving the enemy a new destination each time they reach the last, based on which point is next in the array. It's a pretty nice bit of code, but it's very limited in what it's actually doing. If we make a circle out of these points, the enemy will go around the circle, and nothing else. We can't even make it go backwards through the array without having different code to handle it. Enemies patrolling on a single fixed path with no deviation is absolutely fine of course, I'm sure there's lots of games where that would be perfectly viable. But not here. We need a way of moving around the arena in a slightly more varied way. In a new and slightly more complex map, I have scattered around a small array of points. There are points on platforms, points in seemingly random spots, and there are points at dead ends. If we ran Unity's code on this array, it would be a mess, with our enemy randomly bouncing around points on the map. 
the code no longer does what we need it to. Rather than leaving the decision making up to a single algorithm in the enemy's AI, we're going to offload some of that decision making onto the points themselves, and let them influence the enemy's behaviour depending on what information they have. So I made the patrol point modifier, a small script that'll get attached to all of the points in the array. This script doesn't actually run any code, and instead simply contains information for the patrolling enemy to use when it gets there. For example, there are some points where I always want the enemy to stop and wait for a short period of time before continuing. Because I don't want this for every point, I can't easily work this logic into the enemy's AI. Instead, I'll take that logic and put it onto the point itself, and then have the enemy simply ask the point for that information. The enemy already has access to the point itself to be able to set it as a destination, so it's not hard at all to then access the script that it holds onto for its information. The patrol point modifier system allows me to move away from simple circular patrols and create something more akin to a spider's web, with branching paths and more control over how the enemy behaves when they interact with these points. It's a little bit more setup, to be sure, something I made a point of avoiding in the parkour system, but here it's a nice trade-off for the amount of flexibility it gives me over the enemy's behaviour. Now, on the enemy side of the coin, we need to give it those behaviours. On our points, we can define the next and the previous point. Our first behaviour here is also the simplest, as all we need to do is set the destination to the next point. If the next point doesn't exist, as in the case of some dead ends, then the enemy will go to the previous point. Easy. Our next behaviour is one that will allow enemies to stop at a given point and wait for a certain amount of time. I'm implementing this to add variety to the patrol. It wouldn't be very challenging if the player always knew that the enemy was just going to keep walking around, so this will be a good behaviour to include. When we want the enemy to wait, we call a coroutine called wait at point. This behaviour is a little convoluted, so I'll take this one step by step. When this coroutine is called, the enemy will come to a stop, and after a small amount of time, another method will occur that plays a random little idle animation. This method, unlike our regular methods, is expected to return a certain type, in this case, a boolean. We do this because we want to sort of freeze the coroutine in place while the enemy is animating. When it's finished and the method returns as true, the coroutine can continue with the rest of its behaviours and begin transitioning to a new method. This is where things get a little complicated. I know that I want enemies to wait at points, but I don't always want this waiting behaviour to occur under these exact conditions. Having the enemy stop is just as variable as getting them to move, so I want to set up the coroutine to transition out of it in a way that provides me with the most flexibility. Basically, I want to use this method in other places and I need it to adapt to that application. If you've been looking at the code on the screen, you might have noticed this little mess of symbols down here referencing a method called caller. This little snippet of code allows me to treat methods as if they were their own variables. Now, rather than having 10 different waiting behaviours with their own unique exit transitions, I can simply plug in whatever behaviour I need with this one method. In this case, I can call the method that moves the enemy to his next destination that we wrote before. These two behaviours are maintained by one neat little method called decide next move. Each time the enemy reaches a point, this method is called. The method will access the point's information and move to the next method based on what it sees. If there are branching paths, it'll pick a number and go along the path with the matching index. If it's a choke point, it'll wait for a small amount of time. If there are no special exceptions to a point, it'll choose to either wait or just move on to the next. We have a move and a wait behaviour, so all we need to do here is call them as and when we need them. Tie it all together with some simple animations and boom, we have a patrolling enemy. Overall, the code works pretty well so far to get our enemy around the place, and there doesn't seem to be any more that we need to, um... Huh. And so, we come back to off-mesh links. 
Because Unity gave these things half the functionality that they should have, we have to use a little bit of a workaround to get the enemy to animate properly while using them. Fortunately, there is a few values attached to them that allow us to construct some logic. Off mesh links have a start and an end. They have a link type that we can access in the code, and if there is an off mesh link between the enemy and his destination, then I will know all about it. This is enough information to get the enemy to behave properly through gaps in the nav mesh. Firstly, we don't actually want to move on the link itself like it's doing now. If there's a link on the enemy's path, I just want the enemy to go to the link's starting position. From here, I take a cue from the parkour system and use the height of the platform to direct them into performing a climbing animation. The higher the platform, the higher the climb. We get the height of this platform by getting the Y position of the link's endpoint. Now that we have all the information we need, we can trigger the animation and climb up onto the platform. And after the animation has concluded, we reinitiate patrolling behaviors and set the enemy on his way. It'll work in a similar way when the link type tells the enemy to drop down. I simply find the height that I need, tell the enemy to play the correct animation, and then continue its patrol. It all operates on about 20 lines of code, and additional link types will be simple to add in the future, especially if I ever get the necessary animations for things like ladders. Right now, I haven't implemented anything for jumping, but it'll work slightly differently, so I'm setting it to the side for now. And that's pretty much it, in terms of a simple enemy patrol. We have a bunch of different methods, like moving and waiting, and we can decide which one we want each time we get to a point. We can influence those behaviours by giving those points small portions of information that the enemy can factor into its decision making, and we tied it all together with some easy animations. Even though we only have some simple enemy AI for the time being, that doesn't mean we should slack off when it comes to writing our code. By setting ourselves up with a good structure, we'll make things easier on ourselves when the code starts to get more complicated. I've been in a situation before where my code is finished but becomes almost entirely unreadable because I just added things as I went. If I'm going to take this project seriously, I need to take my code seriously and try to keep things as organized as I can without wasting tons of time. When it comes to keeping code compact and readable, switch cases are always a good choice. If you're at all familiar with programming, you'll know about if statements. These are the backbone of programming and are used all the time. You check a condition and perform certain actions depending on whether that check returns true or false. Switch cases are similar to if statements, if only a little more specialized. My enemies can only ever be performing one action at a time. They can't wait and be moving between patrols at the same time. They can't be moving between patrols and traversing the off-mesh links at the same time, so only one of these states can be active. Since only one type of behaviour can happen, they will become separate cases, all kept under the appellation of patrol type. By switching the patrol type between all the separate cases, we can construct some very solid logic for the enemies to look through. The switch case instance will act like the spine of the code calling in the methods that will send it along the way and set new types at the end. When we need a new behaviour or a new AI, we'll hardly need to alter anything about what we already had because it all loops back to the switch cases again. That decide next move method I had from earlier can branch off into a couple of different methods like waiting or setting the destination, but it all goes back to the spine in the end which will pass it on to new behaviours or look the same ones again. When my enemy encounters an off-mesh link and finishes it, it'll switch to the reinitiation case to restart its patrolling behaviours. Each case will call for a method or set of methods and carry them out until a new case is set. Rinse and repeat. All I need to do is make the method work and then I don't have to worry about it again. If I need a new behaviour, I just plug in the new method and switch to a new case when I need to. This approach might not seem that important now while our code is still so simple, but next time when we start introducing some more complex behaviours into the mix, it'll become very important. It's easy to let these things get away from us 
and have our code become a mess that we'll have to clean up later. By making sure everything is right before moving along, we create less work for ourselves in the future. Our enemy now has some pretty basic AI to get things going. But just being able to walk around doesn't make for a very threatening enemy, or a very good stealth system. So join me next time, when we'll give our enemy some teeth and create some more complex behaviours. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.